Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for our annual Crop Hour webinar series. And uh, um, I'm David Karki. Uh, I'll be your host this week, and this is our Wheat Week. And uh, as you, some of you may already know this, uh, it's a three-day-in-a-week um, webinar series, and this week we'll be talking about wheat. And today um, we have two different presentations. So first our first half hour of the presentation will be um, economically important diseases in South Dakota on wheat. And the second half, we'll, we'll talk about the insect pest of wheat diseases. And uh, before I um, trans, you know, trans, transfer my um, microphone to our speakers, I would like to kind of give you a quick update on um, some of the things on, on Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions, please type that in Q&A. You won't be able to speak or anything like that. So you have to type that question. Uh, the Q&A um, option, look, it's on the on your bottom side of your screen on the horizontal different menus you have. And it has two um, message type icons um, combined together. So that, that's, that's your... Um, that's your way to type your questions in, and I'll be monitoring those questions. And after each presentation, uh, we'll we'll try to address your your questions with the speakers today. Uh, and and if you're looking for or um, looking to get CU credits uh, off of our presentations today, so there will be two CU credits, uh, each of half a credit, and I'll be putting that up after each presentation about a half an hour mark and it'll be there for about a minute or so so have your phone and app opened up and ready to scan that barcode and after the second presentation again towards the hour mark I'll pull that up again for the uh, half and credit for the second half of the uh, second part of the presentation so uh, today like I said we have uh, Dr. Madeline Shires and Connie Strunk as two of the plant pathology uh, plant pathologists presenting about wheat diseases in South Dakota Thank you, David. My, like David said, I'm Connie Strunk. I'll start this presentation off and then we'll transition and Maddie will end our presentation. But at any time, like he said, if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in that Q&A, but we'll go ahead and get started. All right. As you see on the screen here, you know, we talk a lot about the rust you know, rust are something that don't overwinter here in South Dakota. It's something we always scout for, we watch for, we do a lot of looking at, you know, the fields just to see if we're, what we're seeing for rust. We're looking at, you know, temperatures to get that right conducive environment. But the three main rusts that we do get, or the three rusts that we scout and watch for are stem rust, as you see on the left here. As you can tell, it's our little bit warmer of our day rust, even with night, you know, nighttime temperatures get a bit warm, needs some dew to get sporulation going. We have our leaf rust, our most common rust in the middle here of the screen. It's a little bit cooler, cooler of days, but not quite as cool for temperature as what a stripe rust would need. And then nighttime again, it needs a little bit of that, a little bit of warmth. And then again, it needs that dew for sporulation to happen. And then stripe rust is one that we usually get pretty early because of the cooler temperatures during the day and a little bit warmer in the little bit cooler humidity in the evening needs to do what with this rust, you know, if it gets above the temperatures of 80 degrees or higher, we could be losing some viability there. With stripe rust, why it's important is, you know, it is a fungal disease. All of those rusts are a fungal disease. Um, with stripe rust, it often starts as a small yellow fleck on the leaf. Those pustules will de de develop into a line, so like a linear line. I like to say kind of like a sewing machine would do. The color could be kind of yellow-orange, but I don't want to get so tied up on color of any of these spots because as they age, they do get darker in color. And with stripe rust, they tend to not only darken, but they stay on the leaf tissue. And in 2023, we saw very little stripe rust, but it really depended on kind of where you were in the state for a lot of our diseases, just with most of the state being under a drought, you know, we'd really need that moisture for our fungal diseases to take hold. So stripe rust is one that could be quite yield destructive and we do 
recommend fungal uh, fungicide application for this, especially if you're seeing it develop early on the early tillers. So you may have to go at that tillering time frame, and then yet again at the flag leaf time frame to really control this disease if it does become an issue. Next. Just a little slow. All right. So we talked a little bit about the main, uh, some of the rust that we see. Switching gears a little bit is some of the viruses. We're starting to see the viruses kind of come back or be more sporadic throughout the state and within the region. We anticipate seeing more viruses, mainly because you know the viruses are vectored by some insects. We have some insect vectors that can come in early if we're getting things planted early, but we have we've had you know warmer falls, so it opens it up for more opportunity for those vectors to get into the winter wheat when it's um, warmer like that. So our viruses are things to watch for out in the field. Unfortunately, when we're doing and working with viruses, once you identify that you have a virus, there's nothing you can do for control at that time out in the field. You would need to have made note of that so you can choose different varieties. We would turn things black, but we'll talk about management here in a second. But with barley yellow dwarf, typically you would see it on the flag leaf of wheat or even oats. It may have a yellow coloring on that flag leaf or it may have like a purplish reddish type color. It really depends on the variety or cultivar that you've planted, the way it expresses that color. So in this case, we're looking at a field of barley yellow dwarf. Again, our barley yellow dwarf is vectored by aphids. So go ahead and go to that next slide. So our viruses with barley yellow dwarf, they're spread by aphid feeding. In South Dakota, you know, there's multiple species of aphids that can spread and vector this virus. South Dakota, primarily our most common one is the bird cherry oat aphid, but we also see the English grain aphid and then the green bug. But again, there's many species that can vector or spread that. So it would, you know, go onto the infected plant. It, you know, takes some bites. It will go to a little bit of time to trans, you know, transmit it by going to a different plant. So if it's healthy and didn't have that, didn't have that virus, it can spread it to other plants and those what we call subsequent feeding. So go ahead with barley yellow dwarf. Again, what we're seeing for symptoms is you can see that yellowing, red, purple discoloration, appearing often appearing on that flag leaf. You may see some tip burn, some distorted leaves. You may have some underdeveloped roots, which are also attributed to some of the viruses. So you could have some, you know, stunting or some shallow, just not as tillered plants out there. Again, with this virus, our symptoms appear generally on cooler days with some high light intensity. When temperatures get pretty high, the plants can still have virus. You just may not see what we call our perfect textbook symptoms on those plants. Go ahead. With managing barley yellow dwarf virus, a lot of these same principles are in play for all of our viruses. So you wanna delay your planting date because if we plant too early, it opens the opportunity for more vectors to come and land into the field. So we want to plant a little bit later to have that shorter window for ability for those vectors to come in. If you could plant resistant variety, you know, so really take a look, see if you can do that. When it goes to controlling, you wanna control or destroy, make the field black, if you will, any volunteer wheat and grassy weeds in the field and along the edge because the vectors can also go to those plants and they will act as a host plant. And then they come back into our wheat fields or oat fields and they can spread that disease. So the virus will remain within those vectors. So those insects. Other management things that you could do again is you could treat with a seed treatment or a foliar insecticide in the fall if you're seeing those aphids or green bugs out there. So those are some management for barley yellow dwarf 
a fungicide does not work with viruses. It only works with fungal diseases. So these are just a few different pictures of what barley yellow dwarf would look like, some different stages. You kind of see some of that yellowing on those flag leaves kind of across the field. If you go over a picture on the top there, you see some of that tip burning. You see some of the dying out there. Um, just notice that they're not as tillered, could be you know a bit shorter. You just see some of that color discoloration. It usually looks pretty pretty light and it kind of catches your attention. And so you'd be able to walk out there and take a look. Now, generally you're gonna see barley yellow dwarf on those flag leaves. You dip, typically don't see it so much towards the bottom of the leaf. You'd notice it more on that flag leaf first. Go ahead. So with wheat viruses, um, the wheat mosaic complex is caused by three different viruses that produce very similar symptoms. So the diseases or the viruses in question that work with this mosaic virus complex. So when you put them all together, they could really cause some yield loss and some issues. Our wheat streak mosaic, high plains disease, and triticum mosaic. And this is what's really have been popping up in neighboring or area states within the region. Go ahead. Just kind of looking at, well, what is barley yellow dwarf look like versus wheat streak. If you notice on the left, we have barley yellow dwarf. It's on those upper flag leaves. You're seeing that yellowing, that tip burn, if you will, compared to some of the streaking of the wheat streak mosaic virus. Generally, I, I like to say a good rule of thumb is if you're out scouting and you see it on the bottom leaves, this yellowing, the striping appearance, this mosaic-y, if it's on the two lower Chances are you have wheat streak mosaic virus. If it's on the flag leaf where you're seeing it first, chances are you are pretty good that you have barley yellow dwarf. Again, you'd want to test and send in samples just to confirm what you have. And so you'd be able to send that into the diagnostic clinic. But this is just a quick rule of thumb of that. When you look at wheat streak, you know, our viruses, can they be bad? They can be bad. You know, they can be pretty minor or especially with wheat streak, if it really gets going, because generally you're gonna see it on the edge of the field and this vector is just gonna move throughout the field. We can have anywhere from 10% to 100% field loss due to wheat streak mosaic virus. So again, you know, what's the impact of viruses? In this case with wheat streak, it really depend, depends on which cultivar you've planted. You know, when did infection take place? Did it happen last fall or did it happen in the spring? You know, what have been those weather conditions? And is it co-infected with other viruses? You know, is it on its own or are there other viruses causing stress within that plant? So again, yield losses can be quite drastic. Wheat streak is transmitted by the wheat curl mite. This is a very microscopic mite. If you notice here on the right, this is underneath magnification. These mites are blown in by the wind from neighboring wheat or volunteer wheat fields sometimes over two miles away. And so as they kind of ride up the wind, they'll kind of settle when the wind changes or dissipates down. And generally we'll see it on the edge of that field and it kind of moves in. It's important to know that the wheat chromites only survive on green living tissue. And so when we talk about managing, when we say, you know, turn it black or kill off or destroy the crop, the those wheat curl mites, they need living tissue. And that could be wheat, it could be the grassy weeds, it could be oats, it could be volunteer. Like it needs, it needs a living tissue. Go ahead. With wheat curl mites, what they do is they crawl inside the leaf whorl near that growing point. Those non-adults, they're the ones that acquire the virus, but the wheat curl mites can survive as adults, nymphs, or eggs. And the most damage is indirect, and that's through the transmission of wheat streak mosaic virus. So again, the wheat curl mites, they will move. They need a living host to stay alive to be able to pass that virus back and forth. The, the virus needs the living tissue to survive. So the vector is what will move from the wheat to volunteer wheat to the grassy, grassy weeds in that area. So some symptoms of wheat streak, again, you're going to see those pale green yellow stripes on the leaves. You're going to have kind of some mosaic, so kind of a dark and 
lighter appearance. A lot of times you're going to see stunting, as you see on the right side here with the pen in the ground. So you'll want to see stunted, really reduced tillers. Go ahead. Sometimes you'll even see some prostration. So that's where instead of the plant going upright or vertical, it's just growing across the ground, kind of spreading out. So some of the risk factors for wheat streak is really when we look at hail that occurs before harvest. So you have some seeds in the head. If you get that hail at a time and it will shatter and you know send those seeds to the ground, it'll encourage that volunteer wheat. So we want to reduce the opportunity for volunteer wheat. If we have warm temperatures that we go into October, November, that encourages those vectors to come to the field, come to those plants. If you're planting early, especially if you're in wheat stubble or fallow where you've had volunteer wheat, you're planting early, allowing that opportunity for those vectors to come in. And if you've been in an area that may have had some fields, fields that have been infected with wheat streak, chances are that vector is still there and around. Some of the management is we want to destroy the volunteer wheat and grassy weeds. We kind of call this the green bridge. We want to take out all of those green and growing at least two weeks before planting. We want to ensure that the, that crop or those plants are not green and growing. So again, we want to delay that planting in the fall, make it a little bit, a little bit later, plant those resistant or tolerant varieties, rotate to a broad leaf crop if possible, really wanting to kind of break down that pressure from WSMV with those aphid vectors and wheat curl mites. So when we look at the wheat mosaic virus complex, again, it's a co-infection with two or more can be very devastating to the yield. So more viruses causes more stress to that plant. It can cause losses both in winter wheat and spring wheat if those disease levels are high. Symptoms vary or depending on the variety, again, which viruses are present, some of the temperature. Next screen. With the symptoms of wheat streak mosaic virus, again, we have the stunting and streaky discoloration on those leaves. We have often progresses to, to more symptoms and we'll see more with the warm temperatures, the symptoms of our high plains disease, small spots that turn mosaic patterns and eventual necrosis. And then our that third one, that works with this wheat mosaic virus complex is the tritica mosaic, similar to wheat streak, but this case the heads may be sterile or they just don't form and cause very severe stunting and death. So coupled together could be quite yield limiting. And from that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maddie. All right, thanks Connie. So I'm gonna talk about more of our foliar diseases, bacterial and fungal. The first one I'm going to talk about that you've hopefully heard about is bacterial leaf streak in wheat. Um, this is a similar disease to that that you'll find in corn um, as well as in barley. So this bacterial leaf streak is a bacterial disease, which means it cannot be treated with fungicides. Um, it is caused by Xanthomonas bacterium. The symptoms of this disease are going to occur after prolonged leaf wetness, and they typically are going to affect the top part of the plant. So if we have a lot of heavy dews continuously um, and that bacterium is in the field, you're probably going to see some development. The symptoms are going to start as water-soaked lesions. Um, so that's where your leaf is just going to have these uh, more abnormal dark spots. You can kind of see that in that picture in the middle. Um, and then they eventually progress to having the necrosis within the plant uh, leaf. The bacteria overwinters on seed and plant debris. So it's really important to know if you had BLS, especially if you happen to be in a wheat on wheat operation, um, or if you have been fallow for a year or two and then plant wheat back in, um, this could show up because it could have remained in the field. We did observe BLS in multiple counties across the state in 2023. Well, my computer, there we go. All right, tan spot. This is another fungal disease. Um, this is probably one of the ones that you have heard about before on wheat because we do see it a lot here in South Dakota. Um, tan spot begins as a small brown spot on the leaf and it eventually becomes a tan spot with a necrotic 
uh, or a tan necrotic spot with a yellow halo. You can see that happening in that picture. You can see the different stages of it, both the brown spots and the yellow chlorosis that's occurring around them. Development of tan spot is favored by wet, windy weather, and it can develop at any point in the season. We saw tan spot a lot in 2023, especially in the center part of the state. There were some fields that we were in um, out in between Pier and Hayes, and they had extremely high levels of tan spot to the point that it was probably yield limiting. So definitely one to keep an eye on and know that it's occurring. Here's some other pictures of tan spot. That second picture on the top row and the third picture, again, kind of show you um, very typical tan spot symptoms. The bottom picture on the far right, that is actually how it's reproducing and how it overwinters on the residues. Those are fungal bodies that contain spores to start the disease over. So it's very important to know what disease you have and to make sure that you're managing those residues if um, you are going back in with a wheat um, pretty quickly after see, um, seeing tan spot. Another disease that you might not have heard about, but we are actually seeing a lot here in South Dakota is Staginospora leaf and gloom blotch. This is another leaf spot type disease, but it does also affect the gloom, so it affects the head. The leaf blotch symptoms start as small yellow spots that eventually become a brown gray color and kind of elliptical shape. And you can kind of see that in that picture on the screen. Um, the lesions will also develop a chlorotic margin and the, that lesion is where it will begin producing spores for the next year. Um, this disease does overwinter on residues. So that's how it starts the infection for the next year. The gloom symptoms of Staginospora um, are going to start as a purple to brown discoloration. The glooms might appear dirty or water soaked and you can see that really well in the picture on this slide. The fruiting structures can develop on the glooms. So more and more spores can be produced if it does develop on those glooms. The symptoms again of this disease can be seen from tillering to ripen ripening and the seeds can also have symptoms. So we are seeing a lot of this disease. In some areas, we saw more staginospora than we saw tan spot. So we're doing a much more focused uh, scouting effort in 2024 to try to determine um, which leaf spot we're actually seeing. And that being said, we also have a third leaf spot disease and that's Septoria triticae. We are not seeing a lot of Septoria. Um, we, it does pop up here and there across the state but it is definitely much less common. The symptoms of septoria start as tan brown lesions with yellow halos. Again, you're probably catching that these three diseases are a little hard to tell apart because they all look basically the same. Um, with septoria, when it's humid, the fruiting bodies that are producing those fungal spores can actually ooze. And the infection and symptoms occur with cool, wet weather. And that is why we see a lot less of septoria because we rarely have cool, wet weather um, when the plants are the right age for infection to occur. Here's some examples of septoria, and you can see that septoria looks a little bit different as it progresses than the others, where it actually, you can see the fruiting structures growing in the brown spots. Um, it is kind of hard to tell that in the field just because um, usually septoria is not alone. There's almost always tan spot and staginospora in there, so it's a little bit difficult to differentiate, but there is a difference if you can find um, just a field that's just has septoria. Another one that you've probably all heard of if you work in wheat is Fusarium head blight or FHB or scab or pink mold. It has a ton of different names. This is your most typical symptom and it's gonna be where it looks like the wheat heads have prematurely ripened. Um, we, do have some ongoing FHB manage or FHB uh, studies, and I'll talk about those at, on this slide. If FHB has been a problem for you, there are moderately resistant cultivars that perform pretty well. Um, rotating away from corn and small grains will help break that disease cycle. So integrating in a couple of broadleaf crops before going back in with a small grain or a corn will help reduce the fusarium. 
There are also triazole fungicides that can be used at flowering, but you need to look at the weather and use the um, scab tracking website, which is on the next slide, because uh, the fungicides can be kind of costly and you don't wanna be applying them when they're not needed. Our 2023 field trials did show with spring wheat that an application of a triazole fungicide at 10.5.3 or sequential at FEATS 10.5.1 and 10.5.3 were the most effective. So that is something to kind of keep in mind if you do have to make some management decisions about treatment of scab. Um, and this here kind of talks about just in general with wheat, uh, fungicides can be used at tillering um, if we're seeing a lot of stripe rust, like Connie mentioned, developing early, or if you have no-till wheat, again, you wanna make sure that you actually have disease pressure before you're putting out fungicides because it does get costly. Flag and heading timings can be decided based off of this web link right here. Um, please make sure you use that because we need to be use, utilizing it. And then also the flowering timing for scab. Um, this is the website right here that you can use and help to make some management decisions on if you should be spraying. I'm also going to mention some oat diseases um, pretty quickly. We're a little bit short on time. But we have been getting a lot of questions about oats. So the first one is crown rust. If you work with oats, you have probably heard of this one before. Um, this is a great comparison picture between the effects of crown rust. So the picture on the left is a resistant variety. The uh, picture on the right is a susceptible variety. And you can see just the difference in how those look. Crown rust has a alternate host, so that means that crown rust, if you take oats out, it could go to another plant, and that plant is buckthorn, and this is actually the symptoms of crown rust on buckthorn. So it's important to know if you have buckthorn um, around your oat fields, and if you're seeing crown rust on the plants, um, lower, uh, let's see, at flag leaf emergence. So if you're seeing crown rust at flag leaf emergence, a fungicide treatment is recommended, um, I know Melanie Caffey, our oat breeder here at SDSU, was talking, showing me some of the differences in applying um, at flag leaf emergence and after flag leaf emergence and how it affected yield. Um, <clears throat> just have a couple of minutes. Another one that did pop up here and there was bacterial blight in oats. This has showed up every now and then. It's caused, again, by a bacteria, so there's not a fungicide program for it. Um, practicing row crop rotation can help manage this if you're seeing it year, year after year in oats. There uh, are also pathogen-free seed to make sure that the bacteria doesn't come in on the seed since it can survive on those. Um, there's not a lot of details out there about oat varieties that are resistant or tolerant, but there are some cultivars that are just tolerant to bacterial infection in general. Um, one of the best ways to prevent bacterial problems in your oats is to avoid injury to young leaves, as that will give the bacteria an opening to get into the plant. Another one that can pop up, especially if we have a little bit of a wetter year, is Fusarium crown and root rot. Um, the symptoms of this is going to be wilted plants. Um, the tillers are not going to look right. The heads are going to look bleached. If you're having issues with fusarium, um, there are some tolerant varieties and there are some fungicide seed treatment options. And then finally, um, unsure of what disease you're dealing with, please make sure that you contact the plant diagnostic clinic on the SDSU campus. We did just move from plant science building to Berg over the summer. So if you've worked with us in the past, make sure that you uh, take note that we have moved and we do have a new shipping address. Make sure that um, you know what disease you're working with, because if you're putting out a fungicide for a bacterial disease, that's a waste of money because you're not going to get any control. Um, we, I'm really advocating that you don't guess on your pathogen problems. Please send some samples in for testing. Um, the testing fees start at $15 each, so it's a pretty cheap way to figure out what's going on in your field. Most of the resources used in this talk came from the Crop Protection Network website and SDSU fact sheets, so those are another great resource. And with that, there is my contact information, and I will leave that up for just a second. In case anyone needs it, feel free to call or text me on my uh, office number. There's Connie's contact information. And with
with that, um, yeah, we'll just skip this because we're out of time. So with that, we are done. Thank you, Dr. Cyrus, and thank you, Connie, uh, for taking time to share this valuable information. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at the Q&A right now, and I haven't seen any questions. But uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type that in on your Q&A section. Um, in the meantime, when you're doing that, um, we will launch. Uh, so you will be seeing a poll question right now on your screen. Uh, so we'll launch a poll question. And another thing to kind of keep in mind after we're done with the week, uh, you will probably see another email coming in your inbox asking about your feedback on uh, or a survey, uh, you know, um, to kind of provide feedback on what we're doing and how we are doing. So your feedback will be very valuable uh, for us to uh, to design and mold if needed, you know, um, our extension efforts um, in the future down in the down the road. So now our next speaker for today, we have Dr. Adam Varenhorst, uh, who is our um, extension entomologist based out of Brookings main campus. And Adam will be talking about some of the economical important weed diseases in South Dakota. Um, you can take over, Adam. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And today I'm going to mainly be speaking about Hessian fly and wheat stem sawfly and some of the things we saw from 2023. So we'll go ahead and get started. So Hessian fly uh, historically have been known to be in South Dakota. However, we typically say they aren't a major issue. And the reason for that is most of the time we just don't see heavy infestations. The adults are actually very small flies. They're about an eighth of an inch, uh, so very small, reddish to brown, uh, reddish brown to black in color. The adults aren't really causing a lot of issues other than the females are laying the eggs. Uh, the larvae are what are the major issue uh, in terms of causing injury to the wheat. They're semi-translucent. They have a pale green stripe, which you can't see in this picture. And they're what actually feed on the wheat plant. This is probably the stage that's observed the most, uh, at least that's reported to me when uh, small infestations are found within the state, uh, but it's the pupa. So the puparium, that's that outer covering, are dark brown and found near the crown. And uh, what typically is the giveaway for their hessian fly pupa is that they resemble flax seeds. So quite small, but also you typically would find a few, not just one or two near uh, the base of the plant. So for the hessian fly, there are two generations per year. The adults emerge in April to May from winter wheat or alternative hosts, uh, uh, barley, rye are kind of the major other alternative hosts. However, out of everything, wheat is the preferred host. Uh, so they come out of something that was infested in the fall, uh, and that can also be volunteer wheat. The larvae feed for around 30 days on the plants before they move to the crown and pupate. That's what, after a short period of time, then we get a second generation of adults emerging, which are active from August to September. So then they're laying eggs into uh, winter wheat. Larvae will overwinter uh, in that wheat until the next spring start feeding again and then we get that adult emergence in April to May. And so the reason I bring this up is that it can affect uh, when we're getting infestations occurring and the infestation timing uh, causes different levels uh, or different symptoms in the plants. So uh, if we see stunted growth, uh, that a lot of times is due to a fall infestation uh, or when the plants are uh, still young. When the plants are infested, a lot of times they're noted as having an almost blue-green color to the foliage. Uh, that's just your indicator that maybe there's something feeding on the plant. If you observe lodging, and this is actually what was observed in South Dakota during 2023, that means the infestation occurred during stem elongation. So that was that population that emerged in the spring, and they were the ones going in, and the females laying the eggs, and then the larvae were feeding, but that occurred after elongation began. On average, hessian flies can cause 5 to 10% yield loss. However, if we have that infestation during stem elongation, as I mentioned, this is what was seen this year, we can see a lot of lodging, and as a result of that, you get increased yield loss. Now, one of the issues is, is that lodging uh, in Wheat, winter wheat, spring wheat, whatever we see a lot of times causes us to scratch our heads and wonder what caused that. 
Uh, there's another pest we'll talk about, though, that gets a lot of the blame. And so we did some work on that as well. But that that's coming up next. For hessian fly, the biggest thing we can do for management is preventing the green bridge. And remember, the green bridge just means that we're not allowing volunteer wheat, weedy plants being present that the insect can use to essentially survive that period of time between wheat plant uh, wheat being harvested in the next uh, winter wheat fields being planted. And so one of the big things for hessian fly for winter wheat is delaying planting. And these this delayed planting, these dates uh, that typically are said to be uh, where we don't have to worry anymore are called fly free dates. One of the issues is, is that for South Dakota, the fly free dates are probably not accurate anymore. And so in looking at some of the older data, uh, we, we tried to put together some ideas, but looking at it, the old maps that were from the earlier 1900s, for South Dakota, the northern half uh, fly free date would be planting sometime after September 30th. And then for the southern half of South Dakota, sometime uh, after October 15th. And so we've looked and we just really haven't come up with any great uh, fly free dates. We've visited with North Dakota researchers on this uh, because they're also running into a similar situation. Uh, and they were kind of in between because uh, if we look at Nebraska's, that would put us uh, somewhat closer to where we actually are already planting. If we look at North Dakota's, it's going to throw us off quite a bit. So uh, one of the things we might have to do here in the future is actually go out and determine when those flies are active in the fall and come up with our own actual fly free dates. Uh, but right now, uh, it's just something we're working on. For resistant cultivars, there are some options out there. Uh, our winter wheat breeder has been working on this. And so they're, I guess the, the way to describe this is they're going to, to be identified. Uh, to be determined, but there is work going on, and he estimated that sometime between 2023 and 2025, uh, those cultivars should be, I believe, available. Uh, so he's already seen some evidence of uh, tolerant, uh, tolerance or resistance in what he's working on. But the other thing for managing hessian flies is crop rotation. So right now, our best, best bet is don't plant winter wheat extremely early in South Dakota, uh, sometime, I think we're still estimating sometime after mid-September is kind of the best bet. And then crop rotation and preventing the green bridge. So I mentioned there's another insect that can cause lodging to occur. And that insect is the wheat stem sawfly. And the adults of these, uh, if you notice here, resemble wasps. They're about three quarters of an inch long. They have the yellow and black coloration, the clear wings. And so a lot of times if these are observed, people think they're seeing a wasp out in the field. Uh, however, these do not have the stinging ovipositor. The females don't. So uh, not saying that you have to collect every wasp-like insect in a wheat field and determine that, uh, but these won't sting you. The larvae are cream colored. They're typically found in the stems. And if you split a stem apart and find one, they're going to have kind of a characteristic S-shaped. Uh, and that's because that's how they move through the plant. They they have to be in that, that shape to be able to effectively kind of scoot through the stem. Uh, they're relatively small, though, uh, have a little bit darker head. But these will be inside the wheat. And as you can see here, uh, and obviously going to be more of an issue for hollow stem varieties. So wheat stem sawflies begin emerging in May. We need temperatures above 62 degrees Fahrenheit for them to be able to start emerging. The adults will continue emerging, so the emergence period is about three to four weeks. Now, that doesn't mean we have the same adults alive during that entire period of time, because the adults actually only live for around seven days. They don't feed on wheat, and so kind of a short-lived insect adult, and that makes it kind of tough for us to go out and scout, because uh, if we don't hit kind of, if there is kind of a peak, we can't quite hit it necessarily all the time. But we tried this last year. One of the things with these is that there will only be one larva per plant because they are cannibalistic towards one another. And then the larvae will feed until the plants begin to dry down. And then that's, uh, oops, I believe I went the wrong way. Uh, 
begin to dry down and then they actually will uh, if you've seen some of the other talks again they will actually cut the plant uh, near the base causing the plant to fall over and cause that lodging so <clears throat> in hollow stem varieties wheat stem soft fly can cause two to ten percent yield loss depending on how much feeding and uh, how large the population is but they can cause up to 50% loss due to the severe lodging. So this is a field where there is a heavy wheat stem sawfly infestation. Uh, get, to give you a reference, they got some of the wheat that was still standing. So you can see that's a very large area of the field that's lodged. In South Dakota, wheat stem sawfly had previously been reported as being in the northern counties, especially in the northwestern counties. Uh, we know that the those areas have historically had pressure from wheat stem sawfly. We were a little concerned because in 2022, we are getting reports of wheat stem sawfly infestations from several counties uh, where historically this pest wouldn't be a major issue. In addition, we know that Nebraska has seen wheat stem sawfly infestations in our uh, their northern counties. So that would be what border our southern counties. And so we were interested in trying to determine how widespread wheat stem sawfly actually is in South Dakota. And so I'll talk about, talk about that in a second, but for right now for scouting, for wheat stem sawfly, we recommend going out in the spring and looking for adults using sweep nuts. They're, they're not great flyers. Uh, so field edges typically have higher infestations. So if you're trying to determine if they're present, uh, you start on the field edge and then kind of work your way in and move along the field edge to see if there's anything out there. Once we get past that spring period, the next step would be to split stems and look for the larva feeding in the wheat stem. And then before harvest, if you start to notice that you have some cut plants or you notice that the lodging seems to be increasing, the next step would be to look for those plants that indicate an infestation. So uh, if I, I didn't mention it, but that picture, when these cut the plant, uh, typically there's a little plug right below uh, where the plant was cut. And so that's something that you're looking for in those cases. One of the big issues that we have with the Hessian, or sorry, with the wheat stem sawfly is that there are no rescue treatments because just like a lot of our other insect pests, once they get inside the plant, it's very difficult to try to manage them. Also, we have a lot of research from previous years where it says that insecticides aren't profitable because of the fact that these Adults are emerging for a three to four week period. So if we're trying to spray the adults to prevent an infestation, you have to time it right, or you have to use at least three sprays. And in the cases where this was done, uh, they saw a 3.3 bushel per acre increase. Uh, but the fact that you went out and sprayed three times indicates that that's not profitable. Uh, that's not enough of a yield increase to pay for the insecticide applications. Something that can be used for wheat stem sawfly or solid stem varieties. However, these should only be used in areas where there's heavy infestations or a history of the wheat stem sawfly because uh, solid stem varieties come with a bit of a yield drag. So they typically yield about 10 to 15% less than the hollow stem varieties. So if you use that on a widespread acreage and you don't actually have the wheat stem sawfly, you're, you're going to cut your profits down a little bit and so that's why it's important to know where this pest is. So for that reason, we conducted a survey during 2023. We surveyed every single county in South Dakota. So just a reminder, there are 66 counties. We were out there from mid-May to early June. We were trying to catch that three to four week window of when adults are emerging. And we are out there using sweep nuts. We did 121 fields total. So in some counties, we we're only able to get one or two fields and some we were able to get more. A lot of that had to depended on uh, how many wheat fields were actually in the county. And, you know, also we're, we're driving around. We don't know exactly where these fields are. So uh, kind of a needle in a haystack in some cases, but uh, we were able to find those. In each field, we did four transects. So starting on the field edge, we went in three feet, 30 feet, 60, 90, and 120. And then when we reached those uh depths into the field, we collected 20 sweeps from each of those points. So just uh, did some math last night trying to figure out how much we actually collected. We collected 2,420 samples. Uh, so those are bags. 
And then if we do the counts on how many sweeps we did, we did 48,400 sweeps in 2023. Uh, so it was a very time intensive just between the driving and then also the actual sampling. Uh, but uh, we did, did have uh, some interesting results. Uh, we had a hundred and sorry, 119, not counties, 119 fields uh, that we sampled from those 66 counties that were negative for Hessian fly. And so we had two fields that were positive and it, it resulted in actually two counties. So it was uh, a field each per county uh, that tested positive, And that was up in the Northwest uh, Hardings and Perkins County, which happens to be where we know historically we've had pressure from the Hessian fly. Interestingly enough, I said the Northern counties, some of the older surveys, when I say older, we're getting close to, I believe some of them were about a, uh, 40, to, 40 to 100 years ago uh, when some of that work was done. But uh, they did find Hessian fly in some of these other counties. I believe it went two counties down, but kind of imagine just drawing a line across here. And that was where historically you could find Hessian fly. Now, Nebraska, if I remember right, and I didn't include this, they were finding Hessian fly in this region right here in their northern counties. And so uh, we did not come up positive in any of those. And I was surprised uh, when we were able to find, you know, a wheat field in a lot of these southeast counties. So uh, maybe not, you know, 100 wheat fields, but at least one per county. And it was really, really fascinating. So I'm going to switch away from those two pests and talk about a few of our other wheat pests. I know I said those were the main two, but we have other pests that we have to worry about in wheat. And the one that I think I get the most calls in July about are true armyworm. And so true armyworm do not overwinter in South Dakota. They are actually one of those species that overwinters down in the Southern uh, states. And then they wait for southerly winds in the summer and the moths move northwards. Once they start coming north, they start showing up in states just south of us, and then we can kind of use that as an indicator of when we might be seeing infestations. One of the things that always can cause a little bit of variation on when these show up are when we get those strong southerly winds. So some years, uh, they show up a little bit earlier than others, but uh, we, best way to go out and determine if they're present is to use a sweep net. So true armyworm caterpillars will feed on the leaves uh, and Obviously, these aren't wheat plants. Uh, th these are some pictures I had from cornfields. Uh, but the big thing is, is that they will destroy the flag leaf, which can cause yield loss. The other big thing, and this is typically what we see in South Dakota, is that they show up in large numbers right around maturity. So as the wheat matures, the leaves aren't as viable for food source. And so they actually move up to the heads and start clipping them off. Uh, so... This picture actually was from an infestation a few years ago in some of the research plots for wheat. Uh, you can't see it great in the picture, but one of the things uh, is you notice there aren't any leaves left. And so if the wheat is still green, they will essentially go through and just strip all the leaves out. And then the next thing they do when that's done is they will go up and start feeding on the heads and clipping them off. And so that can be a major issue. Uh, True armyworms get their names because when they show up, it's typically not one or two caterpillars. It's normally several, maybe thousand. And so large areas of the field can get hit very quickly. And so we try to put information out as soon as we start to notice them uh, to remind people to go scout. But sometimes we get caught off guard. So we can scout using each, either the visual counts. So just going out and seeing if you're seeing defoliation or head clipping. Uh, we typically use sweep nets because it's a little bit faster because if if there aren't a huge population present, it can take a little bit of time to find those caterpillars. So threshold is two caterpillars per square yard if you're using the visual counts and 40 caterpillars per 30 pendulum swings if you're using a sweep net. Now, this is where it gets a little easier. If you're close to harvest and you start to see head clipping occurring, uh, you can throw out the the sweet nets and the visual counts because head clipping can trigger an insecticide spray as soon as you see it occurring. The catch here is, is that if you're seeing the heads being clipped, it typically means we're getting close to harvest and we have to pick an insecticide that's not going to delay harvest even further. And so I'm not endorsing these products, 
uh, that are listed here, but I am listing them because they have the shortest pre-harvest interval, that period of time between uh, when the insecticide is applied and then when you can actually go and harvest the grain. Bolton has a seven-day pre-harvest interval. Corrigin and Prevathon each have a one-day pre-harvest interval. All three of these products are labeled for management of true armyworm in wheat. And so if you're close to harvest, those are going to uh, prevent, not cause a prevention of harvest due to that pre-harvest interval. Uh, the next pest is the army cutworm. So uh, right now, if we think about it, I know it's warming up a little bit uh, this week, but uh, army cutworm are actually out in the winter wheat fields right now. Uh, so the caterpillars hatch in winter wheat and alfalfa fields in the fall. Caterpillars will feed a little bit and then they overwinter. And then they'll start feeding as soon as the weather warms up enough for them in the early spring. And if they're present in large numbers, they can cause excessive feeding and uh, stand losses. So typically, unless you're out digging a little bit, you won't actually see the caterpillars because they're nocturnal feeders. And during the day, they're kind of hiding down uh, in leaf matter or just a little bit under the soil surface. But a lot of times when these are feeding, the, stand, uh, the feeding kind of looks like somebody took a lawnmower. And it won't be huge patches at first. It'll look like a little circle here and there, and then it starts to spread out. But one of the nice things about army cutworm, not that they're a great pest to have, is that if you treat them in time, the wheat will regrow. So if you catch the infestation early enough, the wheat can recover. So the threshold for army cutworms is two to four caterpillars per square foot, or if you have large areas of the field being clipped, so it looks like somebody went crazy with a lawnmower out in the field, or if you have drought stress present, because as I mentioned, they can recover, the plants will recover, but if there's drought stress, that's going to prevent it from recovering quite as fast. One of the other things we've run into in the last few years with management of army cutworm is you need three to four days post application of the insecticides to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So we might have, you know, South Dakota is great at this. We'll have a nice warm week. The army cutworm get busy. They're feeding out in the field. The next week you're looking at spraying them. You notice the feeding out in the field. And the next week is down in the low 40s uh, for the highs. And that poses an issue because it won't kill the army cutworm caterpillars. The cold weather won't unless it gets really cold. Uh, but the thing is, is that they won't be quite as active if the temperature drops below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you might go out and spray, but you might have reduced coverage and then still have an issue once it warms up again. Another thing is to spray later in the day because that will actually promote coverage because they are nocturnal feeders. So if you spray in the morning, uh, those residuals won't be quite as effective for them as if you spray a little bit later in the day, so it's a little fresher. Another pest I get a lot of questions about are wheat stem maggots. And so... Wheat stem maggots are considered a minor pest. I know every year we see fields where there's a lot of the white heads, uh, which are caused by them. As I'm sure uh, you saw in the other talk, there is another uh, disease actually that causes this. Uh, the big difference is if it's wheat stem maggot, you pull on uh, the top of the plant. And if it pulls real easily, it's from wheat stem maggot because the larva here will feed inside the stem and that feeding causes the plant to essentially not get nutrient flow, which causes it to bleach, uh, but it'll pull out really easy, where if it's the disease, the plant will still be completely intact. So that is everything I have. I think I'm about out of time. But if you have any questions regarding insect issues in wheat, please feel free to get a hold of me. My office number is right here. You can also reach me via email. In the summer, I tried to update uh, I need to update this. Uh, I believe it's X now, but I try to update what used to be Twitter uh, with what pests we're seeing and also any articles I t uh, that we publish on the extension website. Try to throw those on there as well. But uh, that brings up another great thing. If you're not already, please feel free to subscribe to the Pests and Crop newsletter. You can find that on the extension website. We, we post numerous articles each week that's sent out on a weekly basis during the summer and then once per month in the winter months. But great resource for you, and we try to keep up-to-date pest information in there as well as agronomic recommendations. So uh, with that, I'll stop sharing. I'll pass things back over to David. 
thank you, Adam, uh, for sharing that valuable information with us today. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and Q&A box, and I haven't had any questions, haven't seen any questions in Q&A yet. Um, maybe there will be more questions coming or someone is typing. Um, please feel free to um, type in any questions you may have um, regarding insect pests and wheat. Um, and we'll share that to, to Adam and we'll monitor uh, as I'm talking, as we go. And we're kind of towards the end of the presentation for the day, but before we let you go, there should be a poll coming up on your screen. Please um, please do uh, answer that poll question. That'll help us to know uh, how we're doing um, in terms of webinar as, as a whole. And also there'll be a survey, there'll be email coming up later in the week after we're done with this week, um, asking um, some of the questions, important questions you know, as a survey so that we can, we can plan our future efforts even better. Um, so right now you're probably seeing that question regarding the, the Adam's presentation. And thank you again for being here this morning. Uh, I know it's a very nice weather out there. So despite that nice weather, you you know, thank you for taking time to be here uh, with us this morning. And um, and and like I said, there will be an email coming up, um, probably showing up your inbox later in the week uh, about the survey about our webinar series. And um, and this is a wheat week. Uh, you already know this. So tomorrow we'll be coming back again with. Um, Wheat general agronomy and nutrient management in wheat. And on Thursday, we'll be talking about oats and, and seed certification. Thank you again uh, for being here this morning and hopefully see you all tomorrow. <laughs>